It was even... It's 7.06. Do you know where your wind chimes are? Yes, I do. Well, I'll As you can see, <laughs> um, I am recording. Fantastic. Uh, cold opening today. Maud and Ham Ham Jr. are in the Vietnamese jungles in the border of Cambodia and Vietnam. Um, you can read it, so I won't. I won't give too much away of the plot. But essentially, Maud and Ham Ham uh, went down the river, if you know, last time, and they've been uh, predictably captured by natives who think he is their god. It's all a bit old-fashioned, isn't it? I don't know if they still do that. Um, but uh, anyway, there's some shenanigans go on, essentially, that end up with them being set fire to. <laughs> Would you like to be Maud? Not or Ham too much at all. <laughs> Would you like to be Maud, Ham Ham Jr., or some of the uh, natives? I'll be Maud and some of the tasteful natives. <laughs> I mean, we can still use that term, but they are natives of the country. That's what we mean, citizens. Yeah, citizens of the jungle. All right, and action. Keep just down to the end of this hill, and then we'll uh, we'll have a minute, Ham Ham. Oh, you... I'm, get, I'm getting kind of dizzy. Rolling and rolling and rolling. You are glowing a bright shade of brown. I'm throwing up out. I'm throwing up out of my bottom, Maud. <laughs> God, Ham Ham. Oh, who are those people coming round the corner? Hey, everybody, look. Other natives, look. That guy is wearing, um, that, that little boy over there is um, wearing oh. a sin of... Sinopec Fun Run t-shirt. No, I believe we are wearing Sinopec Fun Run t-shirts. Remember, we got that box full and mysteriously dropped out of a plane and was also delivered to us by uh, DHL. Oh yeah, I signed for it. Um, that must be his mother who is cleaning all of the other different brown. It keeps coming out. It just keeps coming out. I think put this man in it. I think oh. this... What did you say, Maud? I said put a cork in it. In all of it, <laughs> I didn't. I didn't hear you say cock. But oh, um, oh, why do all those people wearing Sinopec t-shirts? What's a Sinopec? That isn't a question that Fu Cheng you should be asking. I don't know who any of those people are. No, me neither. Um, what? Um, excuse me, guys. madam and child. Yes. Are you God? Yes. Um, no. Ham ham. Yes, I am. Take ham, me you to know your you leader. Are. I'll we show don't. you. We don't really have a leader. We work on more of a distributed model, distributed leadership model. Uh, we mostly work in cells and clusters and um, work through collaborative online platforms. But whatever, just take me to your main boss. Well, as I just stated, <laughs> we don't really have one. But just take me to a representative. Okay. <laughs> and I'll come too. Noises. Now, what have we got here? A little fat lad. I'm God. Oh, are you? I heard that no. one before. Give me some yeah. grapes. Give him some grapes. Sitting down in that uh, in that tent over there, uh, inside that that uh, uh, office block, and give him some grapes. The only thing he's a god of is fecal quantity. I've got a lot. That's yes. Listen, there's one way to find out whether you're actually a god. Bring your uh, bring the sacred dove, and uh, we'll ask him to bless it. And if he blesses it properly in all the right ways, then he probably is a god and he'll get all the, uh, as many grapes and uh, kiwi fruits and um, mangoes and mango chutney as he wants. What else do the Vietnamese eat? Well, we can get anything we want, you know, we live in a global society. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we don't. I mean, we eat chicken. A barking chicken, a walking clock. Um, is it a scourge dove or a say? Is it a scourge dove or a sacred dove? <laughs> it's both right now. Anyway, take it to the boy. I, take it to the boy, God. I don't have one. I don't think that's whatever the way of blessing it is. I don't think that's going to do it. I'm just trying to stem some of the tide. Stop. It keeps wriggling. I've got it right down inside my undercoat, but it keeps wriggling. Oh, it's not wriggling now. It's stemming some of it. <laughs> that boy has put the sacred dove down his uh, bottom. Yeah, 
I finished with it. It's done a good job. Don't have give it them that. Have you got any more? That was the only dove in the jungle. It was raised by four generations of native on a sacred mountaintop. Oh, it started oh, moving it's again. Moving. It's giving me back here. It's really gushing out now. I'm ham. I am somewhat oh, yeah. uncomfortable. Burn him. Burn him. Burn the traitors. Take him to floor 16 where we've got the burning chamber. And it's I will going to get out of this. Maud, it's a more good cast. She's a question of the ghosts of the Madam Shoe Collector. She's a super secret and lander's clipper and a homophobic scrapper. She's a footnote of a footnote in TV history, but she's got her own pod bean. A ruined wintergreen, ice flavored milk, ice milk drinker, no wintergreen. Glaring at Springfield through suspicious eyes. It's the Maud Flanders Internet Podcast. She's not a watercolor master. <laughs> Season six, episode seven. Episode 59, who would have thought it? Who can believe it? Even though the clips I sent you were labelled, the clip itself said MC episode 5. The title of the clip was, the title of the file was MC episode 6, but it is in fact number 7. Indeed, indeed. But here we are, we've arrived. Uh, thanks, driver. Oh, doodly, oodly, no worries. Don't even doodly talk about it. I'm just going to have a nap here in this mysterious forest. Well, okay, for it, children. It, it, well, it appears that we've arrived at the ancestral home of uh, Maud's mum. What's her name? Magdalena. Marilyn. Uh, Marilyn. Marilyn and Magdalena. But the shack is abandoned, but there's some evidence that, that someone's been here, probably Madge Tinker Turnbull. It looks like she's dropped her t-shirt from when she was a uh, t-shirt cannon lady well yeah that is, she is who we are looking for so uh it's nice to be back on the right track after all the uh barb and bongo incidents even though even though this shack's kind of abandoned can you you hear like cooking and like children running and laughing and screaming i can i hear why can't someone else be on your leg is, is Why can't scrawled someone against the else wall? be on your leg? Because it cures, Marilyn, your duty. Why can't Rex be? You know he has a weak heart. You're a wicked child. <laughs> Oh, this is <laughs> some brutal stuff going on here in the ghostly past. Can't see and anybody. <laughs> it seems like we're in some kind of magical ghost experience because that, that door's just blown itself wide open as if it were Ham Ham's nethers. <laughs> I'm not sure what you're referring to there. No, me neither. But uh, along the, the woods out there, there seems to be a trail and it's lined with these kind of like ghostly glowing and moving like handkerchiefs, like giant handkerchiefs. They could just be um, ghosts themselves, surely. Floating handkerchief shaped items to me sounds pretty ghosty. It certainly does, doesn't it? Well, hello, Goodman Morning and Mocking Laugh Club. Put down this branch of a corp lad, no longer brung to you y'alls by Jeff Apple's Sunderland because the cheque was not received. I hope now it's gone down there. Still, doesn't change our message. All hail. All hail. Corporate. Corporate. Imperialism. Imperialism. Sponsors. Tepco. Secretly poisoning you for over a decade. A new brand energy for every challenge. Improvements to a familiar name. Tepco. And the inheritance of brand value. Hydrogen. It's side this time. It's safe this time. Tepco, walking a tightrope at the Fukushima number one glaring mistakes, family and seclusion, upstate New York epicenter, America, United States, 25 years after Chernobyl. Sponsor, King Louis XIV, fancy good one king, one law, one faith, devout Catholic, one king, one law, one faith. Mercilessly crack down on Huguenots, the Guenos. Daughter is a popular candidate for being the mask or lowly valet implicated in a political scandal. Debauched nobleman, failed assassin and even the twin brother. Expelled all Jews from the French West. Rejected the edict of Nantes. Richelieu, summons of death, assured the king that he knew of no one more capable than Mazarin of filling his place. <laughs> Sponsors. <laughs> <laughs> and vivacious uh, RuPaul's Drag Race 
season six runner up. Cerebus the Aardvark. Dave Sim's ideas are totally justified as one man on internet. Brother and sister Aardvark Vanheim, caricature of sword wielding championed by the online community of Dumbass. My ideas about women, superficially Sim heritage, utterly Michigan arched war nutrition. <laughs> Sponsor, Euros Charles, Pop Mastermind of Peanut Dispenser, Wah 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 Joshua, Dear Ian, Igweld, Finn Chua Chua Chuare, Frontman of the Welsh Psych Folk Pop Quartet, Sunny Sibling Blame It All on Love is out today, Welsh Psych Pop Wonders Nostalgia Trip from its 1970s Pop House Arrest. Well, I think the sponsors keep getting better and better. But as we move on to the two mod for the Torium. Yes. This is from the Andrew blog 2018. The Simpsons kills off Maud but saves Ned in Alone Again Naturally Diddly. Um, spoiler. As I discussed on the Simpsons show podcast, her death veers somewhere between cartoon gag and afterthought. An afterthought. In fairness, Maud was never one of the show's most prominent or interesting characters. And while no one could fault the writer's room for not flashing her out more, particularly on a series where well-developed female characters are vastly outnumbered by their guy counterparts. The fact is that by the show's 11th year, all we really knew about Maud is that she was religious, provincial, and a bit of a stick in the mud. That means Alone Again Natra Diddly, the episode normally devoted to her death, isn't really about her. It kills off Maud in a contrived, wacky, over-the-top fashion that robs her death of any immediacy or emotional impact before dipping into that more meaningful material who amongst us hasn't tragically lost a loved one this way? Death is a tough topic for a primetime sitcom to tackle without developing into very special episode territory or making the proceedings too heavy. I'd be lying if I said Maud's death worked for me. Not my words, by the way. I'd be lying if I said Maud's death worked for me. And it's certainly discordant with the earnest tone the show wants to strike later in the episode. But there's something to be said for the near Looney Tunes tack of her demise helping to take the edge off a nominally realistic cartoon choosing to kill off a character. The episode even finds its comedy backbone when it moves past the ill-conceived stadium precipice tragedy and embraces the pathos of its aftermath. Bart remarking, oh man, why does everything bad have to happen to me when sent to play with a grieving Rod and Todd is a welcome dose of the show's wry humour. Ned's frustration with God for taking Maud away from him after all years of devotion is well earned and interesting as a concept. It's also very brief and not as well utilised as it could be. Reverend Lovejoy's sermon at Maud's gravesite recognises that she was a supporting character in the series, the sort of presence that's easy to take for granted and whose absence is easy to shrug off. But it also highlights The Simpsons' biggest changes to the status quo up to that point, from Apu marrying Manjula and fathering eight children to the Van Houten's divorce. Literally just those two things. <laughs> His speech worked as a tacit... What's that word? Tacit. His speech works as a tacit acknowledgement that however static Springfield had remained over the last 11 seasons, with Homer destined to work at the nuclear power plant forever, Bart and Lisa doomed to remain in elementary school for decades, and the Simpson family as a whole fated to continue going on wacky adventures until the sun burns out. The show still intended to shake things up a bit now and then. Maud's death, spoiler, may have been a financial choice for a network that didn't want to open up its voluminous checkbook for a tertiary character, but it still gave another character who'd been on television for 11 years someplace new and someplace real to go. Thoughts on any of that? Mostly agreed. He didn't really touch on how it saves Ned, but I imagine it leads into saying it opens up Ned for new stories, which they never really did that often anyway. Like, they did it way more like a decade later. Um, she, it is a bit to considering I suppose Frank Grimes got electrocuted but Bleeding Gums Murphy Frank Grimes and Maud are the big three from the early days and uh, Bleeding Gums Murphy just died in hospital in the like, same episode that, he was more or less introduced in no he was introduced in season one I think and then it was season six when they killed him off but they brought him back to kill him off to do a Lisa story and if you want to watch an episode of The Simpsons that deals with death I would say that's the one to watch because the, the, the problem with 
with the um, Alone Again Natural and Diddly is they, they cram like three episodes worth of stuff into one. They have more dying. Uh, Ned and the boys like dealing with it afterwards. Ned losing his faith and finding it again and Ned dating all in like 22 minutes. It's, it's and she doesn't die until shit. like eight minutes in. Yeah. So it's, uh, Most of the, the uh, preceding stuff is NASCAR based shenanigans and hijinks. What annoys me is they sort of killed her and then said, but we're a comedy, you know, we're a, we're a kid's cartoon comedy show, so we don't want to get too heavy. Don't kill her then. <laughs> I think we've already established that we disagree with the decision to do our yeah, offer. Like, and I've heard them talk about before they were going to have more stuff with, like, Ned. Ned actually, I don't think Ned talked to Rod and Todd throughout the whole, like, more to death 10 minutes of the segment of the episode. But uh, they said they'd written a scene and it just kept playing as too sad. But they used to not mind too sad. They used to sort of be okay with it. And at this point, I think they were too insistent on making everything, make, having a joke happen every, like, minute or whatever. Yeah. The thing is, um, when comedy shows do Ned kind of sadness like the last episode of Blackadder uh, what four the war one and the last episode of MASH those are those are consistently like um, cited as some of the best episodes where they were a comedy show will do like a really sad episode so they did have the opportunity to make one of those kind of uh, Oscar winners yeah, they went South with Park the, uh, quite a bit. South Park isn't like there's a South Park episode quite early on, maybe also season six, even though it's for season eleven, um, where Kenny dies and uh, but like dies in hospital and all. Like he actually permanently dies for like a year. I think he's out of it for like a full season. And they just made like a really sad episode. Considering and, uh, this is a character who had died in almost every episode for the first hundred, two hundred episodes by that point. Yes, and with this, they just sort of we'll get into it a lot more at, the, at due time but um, there was many other ways that they probably could have kept it light hearted not particularly funny but light hearted and still successfully killed her without having to knock her from the top of a t-shirt cannon and have it be Homer's fault directly I like the descriptions he has here of her near Looney Tunes tack of her demise and uh, what is it? What is the other one? He says. There's a good one at the end. Ill-conceived stadium precipice tragedy. Yeah. Nice. What's the thing he says at the end about Roswell? Fox didn't want to open its voluminous checkbook for a tertiary character. Very good. Very good indeed. Well, let's move on. To, uh, we've got a couple more of those two mod for the Torium before next season. We get back to the short, sharp shock. We hope. We hope viewers out there are enjoying these longer treks through the internet response to mod flan. I know I, I am. I have a audio commentary. Please, please share it. It's from this episode, and it's about a clip that involves Maud being in a car and Ned slamming the car on somebody, possibly Matt Groening. Somebody says, "I hope she. W I'm glad she's wearing her seatbelt." And then they all laugh. That is it. I, I, the joke, I imagine, being that if she hadn't been wearing a seatbelt, she would have died here. <laughs> exactly. I can imagine there's a scenario where they were they're like, "Damn, we had another chance to do it there," and they were running out of time. So they basically just had to, to make a convoluted uh, attempt to kill her off. Like, yeah. <laughs> you see the episode of Friends where Joey gets killed off and it, they're trying to force yeah. him into the elevator or whatever and he won't go, he won't go yeah. in. Uh, and maybe Ian Maxwell and Graham wrote it on the bus on the way to work. With tears in his eyes, he handed them a tear-strewn piece of paper. <laughs> Hold on, what exactly happens here? Homer's dropped, Homer dropped, Homer drops what? <laughs> they shoot what? Famous t-shirt cannon. Welcome to the Maud Flanders Internet Museum theme park database, uh, currently maybe being fixed by Monkey's E to Y after historical tiding pool toaster fire. We don't know because we're currently stuck in Springfield, USA. We haven't pointed that out yet. We're 25 minutes into this episode. But here's a question for you, Zaz. Thinking about the old, the old Maud Flanders Internet Museum site before it burnt to the ground, what what was your favourite ride? Because of course it was a theme park that we don't mention that aspect very often. I believe my favourite ride was the wind chime aeroplane. <laughs> very good. My uh, second, my uh, my um, I liked the Cockney Revenge ride, which uh, was not directly related to Maud until the end, where she takes her revenge on you as a ghost. Yes, I was never tall enough to ride that one. Well. I know that we've all been disrespected more than once or twice because of our height. Yes. Shall we move on to some content? Yeah. That was even... That's me. Oh, 
walls are whispering throughout the forest. Can you hear them? Can you hear them? Are they speaking to you? They tinkle like wind chimes, the golden scrapbook, the silver legs. I am Vernon J. Pentecost, and this is the Judgment Hour. We await your call. What um, can you give the good people some context for today's content? We're deep into Ned's web of lies in Viva, Ned Flanders. Um, the town finds out he's over six, well, he's 60, and then he has to, Maud has to deal with Ned dicking around for a bit, trying to be young, and then she's got to deal with a whole other kettle of fish when he goes off and does the worst thing he's ever done to the family. True. Clip one, Viva Ned Flanders. We are in church. We have Sunday best Marge. Kaching. I wrote Marge because originally I, I wrote Maud, but uh, I am talking about Marge. Green triangles everywhere. Uh, sun, sun hat Lisa and a, a light blue magagi next to her. We have a heavy lidded. <laughs> <laughs> we have a heavy lidded Maud sat behind and a wide awake Rod also. As Marge says, you mean you've never splurged and eaten an entire birthday cake? Maud's eyes flip open. The rest of her face does not move. Rod looks at Maud guiltily and blamed it on the dog. Lisa goes, Ugh. Wonderful. Lisa's noise seemed, was more of a confused surprise to me than a disappointment. Um, it was very Homerish, I thought. I was like, ah, oh, you are... You are Homer's child. I see. I think Maud doesn't really respond to this because she's got her own little ice cream secret. So she's probably kind of surprised to find out Marge does it too. Maybe it's like, a, oh, she isn't that bad. Like Maybe a little this is Maud, secret bonding. Yeah, this is Maud waking up to the idea that Marge could be a friend. And that will continue for a small amount of time until she dies. Spoiler. Um, yeah, this is a just after the town's found out Ned's 60 and he's just basically said he's, he looks good because he hasn't done anything ever. It's true. And uh, Maud just, out of every, well, the only person in this church who isn't surprised is Maud because she already knows all this stuff. Maud doesn't know about, <laughs> Maud doesn't know about Marge ordering a, a, a birthday cake and eating it all and blaming it on the dog, surely. No, all the Ned stuff. She already knows all the Ned stuff. Oh, of course, she does. She doesn't really care to know anything else about the rest of the town. No, she's not interested in us, but, but her eyes do flip open when that cake revelation is made so she's definitely at least a bit interested in, in um... i am sad we didn't get to hear helen lovejoy's opinion so that we could all look like the mum from honey boo boo when she says it <laughs> what does she say she would probably just say won't somebody please think of the children and the adults what's on please pay some heed to the adults to the over 70s yeah, precisely Could that's you. about it they are driving the flanders are all in their little red car maud is pleasantly looking out of the window and neddy sighs can you believe it maud's head turns to look at darling ned with a slight smile it's almost seemed like those folks were making fun of old steady neddy as he shrugs uncomfortably maud well, she got a nice brooch on her collar. She says, you may be a bit cautious, but what's wrong with that? A hopeful Maud hands out says, some people like crunchy peanut butter, some like smooth. Does she? I, I, I thought to myself. Neddy, and some people just steer clear of the whole hornet's nest, says Ned as he waves his hand. And um, I'll just stick with plain white bread. Thank you very much. Maybe with that, Panther Maud and the boys hanging over the seats with bow ties on. The boys, not Maud. With a glass of water on the side for dipping, they are gleeful, especially Todd. The badly rendered car screeches to a halt, almost sideways in the road. Gosh darn it, says Ned as Maud stirs, blinking, stirring, blinking. Am I that predicty, prediddly ictable? <laughs> Ned bows his, bows his head, sad music. I've wasted my whole dang diddly life, we hear a car. Grandpa pulls up with a bevy of ladies, young uns too. Jasper's there with his head barely visible above the seat. The um, journey song, Anywhere You Want It, is playing. Abe waves and shouts something. Hey there, does he recognize Ned, I ask? Well, look at that. Everyone's living it up except for Ned. Abe then shouts, help. By the sense. Yeah, good scene. Good, good scene. Meaty scene for Maud. Um, I'd argue or speculate that at least one of the four of them is allergic to peanuts. Any as evidence a, as for a, this? Uh, no, just Rod. Just Rod B. 
being Rod, but it does feel like a, there's probably something in there at some point about one of them being allergic to something. That's the that's that's the loose connection. Maybe once he was allergic to something. Um, he's allergic to not having diabetes. Uh, she's very supportive here. She's very earnest and supportive. Like she doesn't want Ned to feel bad. I don't think there's any um, malice behind this from Maud or like personal gain. On that last time, what was the time when the cop when Wigan pulled him over and she was sat mocking him in the car? That was the bongo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, that was um, that was in this <coughs> in the live show. <laughs> that was when um, he was hopped up on goofballs. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, what else happened in this scene we've just oh yeah our second um, hearing of this journey song whilst Maud is around exactly second and final currently uh, uh, our our, um, our exit music and as, as of now journey have not uh, called us on it what's that guy from American Idol oh yes Andy Jackson yes that's the one Paula Abdul um, <laughs> grandpa's been I think they've been kidnapped so it's not all fun and games for Grandpa and Jasper. Ned has just read the situation wrong. Um, um, the idea of dipping bread in water is awful. <laughs> as, as a treat. That's, yeah. That's not good. It's just, it, just the thought of it disgusts me. <laughs> Wet bread <laughs> as a treat. No wonder she's gorging ice cream in the attic. Especially when, when non-fat ice milk is seen as a real treat and uh, your average kind of like uh, after-dinner snack or dinner snack is um, <laughs> is moist bread. <laughs> yeah. Peanut butter is too intense for Ned, which makes it makes sense for why he looks sexy. Carl says something like, even the boy in the bubble had a deck of cats. <laughs> Oh, Ned. Oh, Ned would. I told you the story before, I'm sure, that I met a guy on a Greyhound bus that looked exactly like Ned Flanders, and he was also in his 60s. <laughs> it's like, uh, was it really your mate? It wasn't, no. He, he, this guy looked, he had the full-on like Flanders, almost like a cosplay, and I was like, dude, how do you look so young? And he, he was a Seventh-day Adventist, and he said, oh, there's tricks. There's tricks. There you go. God <laughs> will the, teach you. The trick is being 35 years old and telling people you're 60. That might be a good way of doing it ned just goes for avoiding any but again it's sort of it backfires a little bit because ned in early simpsons days wasn't like this like he was sort of more just like a annoying neighbor so you saw him like drinking beer and you know he's got a rumpus room but no rumpus but, has been happening there for a while no so, are you yeah, suggesting that maybe they've taken his character and they've doubled down on a particularly defining trait? It seems that it's subtle, but it's in the. What would that? What would that be referred to if you did that? I believe it's called Kirk Van Houtening. <laughs> Flanderization or something like that. I believe so. If you look on on TV tropes or whatever, flanderization is the notion where you take That's basically awesome. one one or two defining traits by a character and they become everything that the character is. It's like the opposite of character development. That's always good for a podcast as well, um, giving people the, the website and telling them to look themselves. <laughs> well, I'm not. <laughs> it's like a... You know, interactive. Clip three. Yeah. Ned walks into the Flanders kitchen. He passes by a glass with a cool effect of a stretched face. And I think, is this a film reference? Looks good, though. It does. He passes a home sweet home sign and some sweet bread on the plate. Where have you been, Ned? He says a slim line Maud and wide awake kids. Why are they so wide awake in this episode? Where have you been, Neddy? In the bathroom pause, not trimming my mustache. He runs his think fingers through a wildish, unkempt mustache twiddles it a bit, crosses his arms. What do you think? Do I remind you of troubled troubadour David Crosby? Does Maud know David Crosby? He's Lionel Hutz's sponsor. We see him several times. No Maud laughs a little. Ned gestures towards, and uh, Anne gestures towards herself. Do you, you remind me of silly Billy Ned Flanders? And they all laugh mercilessly. Yes. <laughs> Here's a picture of them laughing mercilessly. This angers Ned who says, would a silly Billy sit like this? Spins the chair and sits on it backwards all cool. And we hear a crack, classic, almost back of the head shot. 
as Maud and the boys look on. The room is spacious. Oh, says Ned. Maud turns to, to Rod. Call Dr. Stein. Who is this doctor? Ned is rubbing his sore back. Excellent. Some more front and centre Maud stuff. She's certainly in this episode. I can say that for sure. Um, I don't think the glass is a ref. I remember them talking about that on the commentary and just saying it was sort of like a fun animation thing to try or like they were trying to do like different animation shots or keep it interesting. I believe that's what that is, but it is very cool. And it is the, he has just been talking about glasses of water as well in the previous scene. So it's, you know, deep or whatever. Relevant. I don't know, Google it. Um, that home sweet home sign looks like the peephole sign. I'm pretty sure that says home sweet home. So yeah, maybe got several of them. Yes, I'd like to think Maud made these and um, chose herself which ones would and wouldn't have peepholes. People. I think just the one. Just the one. Um, this is sort of, this is the most relaxed I've ever seen Maud, Rod and Todd around Ned. Not that they're particularly, you know, like uptight around him or stressed around him, but this is sort of the most jovial and like family, like real family situation. Like they're just sort of, Maud's made a little cutesy joke and the kids are having a great time with it, Rod especially. Rod's never laughed so hard in his life, uh, being, uh, hearing his dad being called a silly billy by his yeah. by his mum. It's probably wildly unexpected for them as well. Like they've, to my knowledge, never heard her made a joke. Curse. Never heard her curse. No. In such a humorous um, fashion. I don't know if she would know who David Crosby was. He's Maybe. very popular. I'm gonna, we'll give her the benefit of the doubt and say yes, she does. Um, Dr. Stein, question mark, which would be, it's, a, it's quite a traditionally Jewish surname, I would say, Stein. And um, it's nice that Ned takes faith out of the equation when it comes to his back problems. As long as they can fix me, I don't care what they believe. Exactly. You can have 12 gods all with 12 arms as long as you take this lower back pain away. Well, that's very open-minded, isn't it? But yeah, all good. Um, what was the other thing? The delivery, Roswell delivery, is good. Hearing Maud go from jovial and silly to deadly serious when she says, call Dr. Stein. That's some good. A switch. That's why they pay her the middle box. <laughs> That's why they pay her the 70 to 100 bucks an episode. She gets Hoover tax as well. If she, if she voices Miss Hoover, she pays them. I imagine so. One of her favourites. Yeah. Good for Great lighting as the men are driving through the desert. By men, I mean Ned and Homer. They are heading for Vegas, I imagine. Homer is serious as he looks at the road. Oh, and Ned says, it's going on 8.30. I better call Maud. I better call Maud. Ooh, it's a good title for a show. And tell her where I am. Homer says, relax. in his kind of like cry baby voice. I called her from the gas station. Ned trusting. <coughs> Foolhardy Ned says, thanks, buddy. And looks forward <laughs> relaxedly. Fanar sucker sneers Homer in a clearly audible way. <laughs> yeah, I like this Homer. He's um, Ned has turned to him to learn how to have fun, so he's just put himself under Homer's control. And um, I see it as I'd better call Maud in a kind of she'll be worried way, not in a I better call her or she'll kick off kind of way. I just thought it sounded like the TV show I Better Call Saul. <laughs> It does, under the TV show Maud. It's like a mix if B. Arthur became a lawyer for the mob. Exactly. <laughs> it's a shame she's dead. Rest in peace. She just died this week, didn't she? Almost 100 years old. Betty White. Yeah. Are they the same person? That was pitching. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it is good. Like, I think, again, yeah, just sort of making it look more interesting. But um, I think that Ned just sincerely buys it and then Homer just admits that he hasn't and Ned still doesn't really do anything about it. Well, I think it, it suggests that Ned is kind of playing along with the thing. He's like, I don't really want Maud to know that I'm gunning it for Vegas. Where does she think he is? It's never explained and we never see her. But like that clip we just saw was the last time she appears in this episode. And that's like like so we, three minutes in or something. Yeah, so we don't know if she knows where he's gone, if she knows what he's doing. And we're going to heavily assume she never finds out. I'm which guessing is, she does not. It adds a layer of tragedy to Maud's story that was not the prior that she now you know she that she can't trust ned she wasn't even his only wife no and uh, that's a shame for her because she just she goes to the grave not knowing what a bad person he is because of homer and she goes to the grave because of homer as well Ka-ching. so basically yes. every bad thing that's happened to her uh centers around that buffoon it's almost like they wanted to aim the show more towards the 
adventures of Homer rather than the uh, tragedies of Maud. Exactly, but the tragedies of Maud is where we would like to spend most of our time. Yes, unfortunately this one happens because of the adventures of Homer. Um, it, the last time he went missing, she didn't care though, really, did she? She went to like she went to see Marge like the morning after and was like, oh, it's Homer home, Ned's not. And Homer was home at that time, so I guess if she goes there this time and says, oh, neither of them are home, she'd be like, oh, whatever. I'm sure he'll be okay. Yeah. He's a big boy. So yeah, we don't know what she... We're all speculation at this point. We are just seeing the brief times that Ned remembers Maud exists whilst he's in Vegas. <laughs> Tears. She sat at the table with a an empty tub of Hagen Dars and um, tear strewn wedding photos. Yes. But who's He's wedding? On I ask. Debating whether or not to call Doctor Stein. <laughs> Doctor Stein, can you bend a broken heart? <laughs> I'm afraid no. I, I only do lower back problems. <laughs> Clip five. Viva Ned Flanders. Two saucy ladies are on a bed in a hotel suite, probably Las Vegas. They are backless. I repeat, backless. <laughs> One is filing her nails. They both have bouffant-ish hair. Homer is distressed, saying, let me get this straight. Ned and me married you two. Green eyed shot eyeshadow lady sparks up a woodbine and says oh we're hitched all right hand to other slightly bagged eyed lady blue eyeshadow and great quiff fringe till death do us part hand to ned uh huh uh, I'm working on that. He stood on the edge of the heart-shaped pool with his belt around the shower curtain, which is in tatters, and um, around the rail, and also around his neck. He begins to pull. Oh, Homer runs over. No, think of your wives. And somehow whips off the belt in one go. There is only the mildest whiff of Maud. There is only a very... Him saying the word wives at the end made me think, well, Homer is now referencing Maud in this seemingly genuinely sincere moment of him saying like like he's just stopping Ned here from doing something stupid because he likes Ned a deep down there isn't any like he his instinct reaction is to save Ned and say think of your wives you know why don't you be rational about this but bad move from Ned I will say it was a it was a an, probably a little bit over the top but to be honest <laughs> it's hard to get out of it the uh, marrying a stranger in Vegas trope is um is one that is a difficult hole to dig one out of cartoon or otherwise well Homer gets away with it eventually she turns up this is like spoiler territory but um Ned gets out of it by his wife dying so she never finds out and then Ginger who is Ned's wife and Amber who is Homer's wife both arrive in town and um so that's how Marge finds out and then Ginger moves in with the Flanders for a brief period by, by that I mean like eight minutes of an episode and um, um, she can't she can't get on board with how godly they are um, I think that might come up to be honest because at one point I think she goes to be sick and Ned says to Rod and Todd who wants to hold mommy's hair <laughs> um, but then yeah she flees and Amber Simpson also flees and then Amber Simpson also dies oh god so out of the whole situation yes so Ned and Homer have both technically lost a wife. I guess. They get divorced in this episode. Is that coming up later or we never get to see? No, they just run away. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I get it. Just... The last clip, yes. Yeah, spoiler, that'll be next week. Yeah, they just remain married until death do some of them part. Um, and the, that the term gang probed turns up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Wait, there is an age, well. there's an alternate universe where uh, Ned Ned was successful here, and then Homer had to go back to Springfield and explain <laughs> what had happened to Maud. Oh, God. Oh, God. Homer would have made up some some horrific lie that would have got them away with it, but thank yeah, the spaceship probably would have come up. Thankfully, it was all played <laughs> all played for laughs. The yes. 50 spaceships. No funeral. Um, yeah, this is a rough one for. Uh, again, we're talking. We can't have Ned talk to Rod and Todd about Maud dying because it it isn't funny. It's too serious. But here he is, two seasons earlier, fully willing to abandon his family on a whim and do something that will not get him into heaven, as he believes the word of the Bible says. Just because of a situation that turned out to be relatively solvable. Yeah, I mean, surely. In the old Douglas Adams phrase, it's better, rather than wishing I was dead, surely it's better to wish that you were. Exactly. I don't wish that I'd never been born, I wish that you never had. <laughs>
that would be Maud's response. There we but have it then. Upon, if, if Maud had remained alive and found out about Ginger Flanders, I think he probably would have stuck by Ned. He probably would have understood the circumstances, but I think she would have somehow got it. You know, she would have had some sort of bitterness and she would have taken it out on him probably at the mini golf place. Well, I, I, I would say that given the spin-off series that's digging into that era, who knows whether it did happen in some off-screen thing that we didn't hear about and they came to some they came to some some um, agreement on how to move forward as man and wife perhaps maybe man and wife the diary <laughs> maybe they, exactly maybe they just became best friends I think Man and Wives is a, is a good title for their spin-off show. <laughs> Ned Flanders, Man and Wives. <laughs> it's definitely an unexpected turn. I diddly doodly do. He yes. says something like that in the, in the scene when he marries her. Married twice with 2.4 children. Yes, thrice. Yes. <laughs> married thrice. Married quad rice. He's a string of dead wives behind him. <laughs> God. Well, Ginger's not dead, though. No, that's true. He's like, um, what's that? What's the jinx? guy called the one who died this week Robert Durst Fred Durst Fred Durst from uh, from Limbiscuit yes he died no he didn't no not him it must be Robert Durst then. yeah I know that is you should watch the Jinx the documentary Maud, Maud is not in it I'm watching um, School of Chocolate on Netflix is she in that no but she'd approve <laughs> of it it's very wholesome although it's a little bit too progressive for her taste I don't she's know how she'd feel about the a, sugar more of a bake-off thing and yes definitely she wouldn't like just the sugar Sheer amount of sugar in on, on display. Exactly. So, but um, now we've headed out into the woods, and um, who, who's that over there? Oh, it's it's only somehow some kind of police chief, Wiggum. And what does that? Who's that character? What does it say in his badge? Flim flam. <laughs> Agent, Agent Flim. Flim. Oh. oh, who are you two visitors what have come to our little town? Hello, I'm Zaz. And I'm Brendan. Brendan. We're looking for a killer. Oh, well, I'm looking for the vole disappearances. All the voles have gone. See, he saw Flim Flam. <laughs> oh, Flim Flam, <laughs> you only speak Portuguese? We. Oui. <laughs> even... It's a quiet storm on a loud and stormy heart. It's 7.06 p.m. a.m. Do you know where your wind chimes are tinkling? I am Vernon J. Pentecostal, and this is the Judgmental Hour. Get your legs, get your legs. The youth is corrupt, the old is corrupt, the path is false. The handkerchiefs dingle and dangle in the wind. Um, oh, what's one of what's there's a shoe there, and it seems to have a MTT written on the inside in a marker pen and, and a giant handkerchief. Oh, it's gone. Uh, did you see that? Oh, it's back. Oh, it's gone. I again. see hints of it. Just hints. <laughs> it's gone. All right, come on, let's get into the forest. Bye, Sheriff Wiggum. Hopefully, very you, creepy. You, I'm going to come with you and see what happens. Sayonara. <laughs> Who are those? Who are those three people here? They I'm, seem to be. I'm Penelope <laughs> Hydra Turnbull. And I am Portia. And I'm Magdalena Hawksbane. What? Magdalena? But surely you're. Do, 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 do. Don't say that word. Dead. Said don't say it. <laughs> well, this is creepy. Oh, yes, I am dead. I'm back from beyond the grave and I've got more legs than ever. What do you want to know? Uh, destiny. We would like to know if um, Madge Tinker Turnbull, your granddaughter, had anything to do with the death of Maud Flanders, your granddaughter. Oh, no. <laughs> I would have. Okay. <laughs> How the bloody hell would I know that? We're just having a picnic. How about you, Penny? No, I am Penny. I thought you were my Went Delena. back to the beginning of the list. Oh, well, well, you were a waste of my time. Let's get going. Would you like just a cr cress sandwich? No. <laughs> just cress. And a bit of margarine. And some water on the side for dipping. <laughs> that sounds disgusting. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Um, wow, well, there's even more ghosts floating around in these woods. It's almost like we're in the uh, jungle on Lost. I'm, I'm Desmond Turnbull. What advice should I do? Scottish. Oh, I'm... But it wouldn't be American, but I guess... Uh, 
Hi. Oh. Hey, hey, I'm Desmond Turnbull. I'm going to say my full name. And I am Rasmus. <laughs> And I am Mitchell. Tell you what, though, you you guys, you're really rubbing your luck up the wrong way by coming into this forest. Why? Because there's a curse on it, and anyone what comes in here. Well, that's that's not great. We've come in. Well, you curse now, and the, here. the only way you're going to get a answers to your questions, and b, and you know what the curse is? The smallest member of your group, their head explodes. Oh, flim flam. <laughs> Idios mio. <laughs> flim flam. Oh no. <laughs> anyway, boys, if you want to lift the curse and find out who done the murder, go to Ginger. Deal. It's that way. I know. I'm going to Which go works? Home. This just forest it, is a... Just put it on your Google Maps. It doesn't Ginger's, work out here. Ginger's house. The arse and an You have to lift it up high. Step again on his shoulders and lift it up high. Use the corpse of flim flam as the, as the pole. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, we'll find her. We'll find her in due time, I'm assuming. But while we're doing this, here's what I'd like to know. Spectral specula speculations as as. What we don't know is what happened to um, Maud's mum. What's her name? Marilyn. <laughs> what Still. happened to Marilyn when she left Turn Peaks and it's eventually met Frank? What's happened in the interim between the kids being born and, and her leaving uh, Turn Peaks? Yes, that is a twist from the uh, question you had written down that I said mentally planning for in my head minutes ago. Um, she, the whole family left, I believe, because Magdalena at some point lived in the Washington. Now, I think, let's say she moved there when she was old. They took her in. So Marilyn left at the humble age of 28 because she had formed an intense friendship with seven of the voles that were present at the time and they just I think because of poor parenting um, she eventually thought they were speaking to her and maybe they were it's a wacky town but they told her that she needed to move to uh, Washington State to fulfil her destiny and they already they in Washington isn't it isn't Turn Peaks already in Washington State? Is it in Oregon? I thought Springfield Township was in Washington State. No, Springfield Township is where where Maud grew up. It's in North Dakota. Oh, yeah. Then, yeah, the, she has to move to North Dakota to fulfill her destiny. Okay. On the way, she lives in um, Iowa for a year working on a bean farm. Nice. Does, the, does she, she ever that. use the voles in any kind of entertainment capacity? Because it seems like that's, a, that's, that's prime for working in a circus or something like that. No, they're very serious voles. So they, were, they are capable of doing tricks. But the tricks are more like financial aid or uh, organising meetings. But less of tricks and more of kind of logistics. Yeah, they basically became seven... Um, um, PAs. So she was very well supported in her endeavours, whatever they were. That was in Iowa. And then she moved to Hawaii for six months. Oh, wow. On a whim. One of the voles told her to do it. And then eventually she settled down in North Dakota and let the voles free in North Dakota to roam. Ah. So maybe we can pick up on that story later and find out some of the details and find out when she met Frank and all of those things. Yeah. That would be great, wouldn't it? Would be. So, do we have any time for a Maud diary today? I believe we do. I will dig out the tome now. Dear diary, it's four o'clock in the morning. Uh, Ned's not home still, but Homer Simpson called and um, he just said a lot. Of, he pretended it wasn't him and he just said a lot of vaguely uncomfortable to me things about the shape of my body and my um, top shelf. I, uh, I, I could hear Ned in the background though, so I know he's alive, but it sounds like they are in Las Vegas, a city that I once visited at the age of 24. And I'm, I'm a little bit ashamed to say this, but I had a, I got married and I've never told Ned because it would break his heart because the person I married was um, the blue herd lawyer. Big fan. Um, but because he's a lawyer, he got us unmarried the same day. Um, his name's Kyle. Get your golden legs. Uh, 
the team now. So I'm highly unlikely that any of us are going to be killed at any time soon, as long as we have the beat gig. And viva Roswell. Bye. The majority of that diary was cut out by the extended freeze that happened. So um, there was a lot of mystery in there, but um, maybe we'll we'll shore up some of those uh, missing sections in another part. Maybe they were, were redacted. They were anyway. just the pages were blurred out, so I had to improvise. I once went to Las Vegas and I stayed in a youth a youth hostel on the outskirts of Las Vegas. And I remember finding a letter that was clearly written by someone who got married in haste. And um, whether or not the letter had been given and then thrown away by the recipient or never given, it was uh, it was somebody spilling their heart out over the decision to get married, not being a great one, <laughs> and, uh, and regret uh, flowing through all of their body and bones. But you know, Vegas is that kind of town. That's a much more Ned way of dealing with it. To kindly Ned Ned has the emotional capability to let Ginger down gently. But yes, he does. Unfortunately, he just follows Tom and gets into fight with the Moody Blues <laughs> and uh, is then thrown out of Vegas. Spoilers. And we shall, spoilers. We'll see that next week. But as for now, we're in the we're deep in the in the the woods looking for Ginger in the forest, and um, there's a portal. So shall we, let's, let, let's leave the body of Flim Flam where it is with the, just in this clearing. There's a vole in his head now. Oh. It's burrowed. The, but the voles have all gone missing. No, that's one. I can see just a hint of Madge as in these portals as we go through. It seems like some kind of non-space. And We're someone's hanging t-shirts on a washing line. Into a non-space. Eat, eat my t-shirts. There's Madge. Is she being held captive by a small man and a tall man? It seems that way. They're probably going to speak in an unlinear fashion as well. And they're, they're, that must be Ginger, that, that little that little tiny old woman with ginger hair and a, and a, a, a ginger beard and ginger pants. Yes. Are you, are you Ginger? Yes. Yes. Please play a show. You're gonna, you're, gonna, you're gonna play it backwards, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> Is all of this try. going to be backwards? Because that would be cool. Let's see. Oh, yes, I am in the room. Oh no, because yeah, you he, the words are not just backwards, they're recorded backwards, but you're speaking them like they're uh, forwards, right? Yes. You have to do this funny Anyway, back to the back to the thing at hand. My, my man, she's being held captive. Ginger, Ginger, why did you put a curse on the family? Because they're not pets. I mean that's true, but what did they do that's so bad that you would curse all the family for all eternity? The handkerchief. It's here. He got it's this oh. one. Is this it? Yes. Been looking for that for a while, have you? It's either it's under the it's nothing under the couch, under the cushion. Oh, it's always the last around. place to look. It's <laughs> um, well, okay, we found your handkerchief. Can you lift the curse and release uh, young Madge over there? Yes. And, I'll, and, and I bet you'll go even one better than that. Mm. Yes. Oh, there's voles everywhere. Can you see so, that? They're all just flooding out of Flim Flam's body. He was a conduit. He was the nexus of all voles. Yes. So does this, Ginger, does this mean Maud's alive? Hello. Oh, all right, well, let's make our way back. Um, just you, me, Madge Tinker Turnbull, the body of Flim Flam. And we haven't seen Sheriff Wiggum for quite a while, so maybe he's gone off. To hang around with those uh, three old ladies. Make sure you keep managing them handcuffs. He's well, sneaky. Mean, she is sneaky, but she's got nothing to hide, nothing to fear. <laughs> That's a very presumptive. 
say presumptuous. <laughs> Guilty until found innocent. Who's going first, you or me? Uh, me. Driving the Thunders are all in their little red car. Niddy seals. Some bets and Margaret, you mean you've be after guilty and blamed it on the dog. Bread thin at you very much, cast gratuitous. I've wasted my whole diddled, him we said. <laughs> Recons. Everyone's living it up except he. German A level, mustache twisiddles. <laughs> Troubadorio. Oh, Troubadorio, David Crasby. Slimline and Maud. Shass, mouse, tums, botty. <laughs> Driving throat, edesits, Vegas plumbo. <laughs> locks, locks, and the bull bouffantish. You, you, warlin. The waffle bar is closed. I'm so very sorry. <laughs> oh, that's hey, next week. Man. That's all next week stuff. Spoiler. Uh, we did it. We did it. Spoilers. Way we want it. That's the way we need it. We're going to take your song, Randy. We're going to do whatever we want with it. We'll see you in Hollywood. We did it. <sighs> we did. Knackered. This is your host, Jay Vernon Pentecost, on the Judgmental Hour. This is the water and this is the wall. Drink all and descend. The horse is the light of the eyes and dark with it. 7.05 and 59 seconds. That's where we always are. Remember, every portal is a dream. And every dream is a choice. And who was it? Those grubby fingers touched the trigger of that t-shirt cannon on that fateful day. This is the water and this is the wall. Drink all and descend. The horse is the light of the eyes and dark with it. Doesn't matter. All matters is what lies beyond. The voles are watching. Flim Flam. Flim Flam. Agent Flim Flam. This is the water and this is the wall. Drink all and descend. The horse is the light of the eyes. And dark with it. Flim Flam. Uh, I'll see him now.